It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you Block Digest episode 267 at block height 681,581 on Sunday, May 2nd. So what is up, gang? Hello, sleepyheads. Stimmies. We need stimmies. You're the sleepyhead. I know, but I bet a lot of other people in the audience are also sleepyheads. Wait, you stop doing that. It's called go to bed. This is why drugs were invented. Some people can go to bed without drugs. Yeah, but they're weirdos. Guilty as charged. So, yeah, I don't know. Icebreaker. Kind of kind of didn't really feel like putting the news desk together that this merited a, an official story chunk. But, um, yeah, have you guys seen the... Uh, supposed uh biden taxes being proposed or just eat the rich yeah. I, thought, I thought it was interesting i caught uh, a guy named martin armstrong's quote on this that he thinks this is going to potentially cause uh, a market sell-off in the year uh because investment advisors will advise their clients to take some profits off the table while it's relatively inexpensive for them to do so as opposed to future years where it'll be more costly for them to do so um so i don't know that this is necessarily market positive even on that basis mm -hmm. no i mean all it's, it's like gonna, it's, all it's gonna do is affect all of the moderately well-off people who don't have great account managers and don't know how to handle this kind of thing like again the anyone who thinks that this is actually going to affect rich people are idiots. Like, sorry, do you not know that they're <laughs> they have the money to pay accountants to find loopholes and all of this shit? But that's the thing, though, is if because like I think for the highest bracket, it would literally be doubling um your capital gains rate. So, like Bud said, dump it. And if all the wealthy people dump it to pull some cash back on the table, um, yeah, normies hold those things too in their 401ks and their pension funds, et cetera. Yeah, so once again, the poor pays and the rich don't. Like, this doesn't solve the situation if that's your goal. Maybe Biden is trying to ensure that the Bitcoin cycle completes this year. <laughs> Another interesting little, little aspect of this, though, is um, he also wants to give the IRS yearly summary reports of all deposits and withdrawals from everyone's bank accounts, all of them, J just as a normal thing now. Yeah, this smells very Chinese as far as calling all the money home from WeChat and everywhere else. It kind of sounds like he wants the full database so yeah fun fun times ahead as this evolves as a uh restaurant sign uh told me in the middle of nowhere of the united states irs tax returns are imaginative fiction but you you get in real big trouble if you don't go along with the plot yeah, it's one of those things the founders had figured out and wrote into the Constitution along with sound money and then we annihilated last century. No taxes on wages. They were to be exempt. But standing army's got to eat. Yep. You guys ready, though, for the first story? Um, something else going a fucked up direction? It is. What else? The Mighty Browser. Um, yeah, 
So this new project is going to fix all of your fucking internet problems. Like, the, dude, Google's going to fix everything. Your computer constantly slowing down because you have too many tabs open, too much fucking garbage loaded on your computer. It's all going to go away. You know what? Why? Because you, you just download this mighty browser and you don't even have a browser anymore. You have Google Stadia, the streaming video game thing that face planted for your web browser. You don't need to want or run your web browser on your, on your computer. I mean, dude, do you really need all of that private information that you constantly enter and manage sitting on, on a machine you, you control? No, dude, just, just put it in the cloud. We'll just have your browser running in the cloud on a stack of parallel computers, always with the power that it needs, just streaming seamlessly to your fucking desktop. So you never have a frozen up machine again. You don't have all those tabs open slowing down your fucking browser because we'll just run it for you in the cloud. <clears throat> don't think about the fact that we would see your credit card information, passwords, all kinds of other fucking shit. Um, if it was architected wrongly or intentionally that way, or that was the whole point of it, you know, they just get to see everything that you do. It's not just scraping cookies and see the shit you connect to in the metadata. No, they get to see what you actually fucking do because you're the dumbass who decided I'm going to run my fucking browser on the Google Cloud backend instead of your own desktop. This is what they're going to fucking start pushing. This is the direction that these companies like fucking Facebook and Google are going to try to keep pushing the Internet. They just want everything running on their machine so they can data mine all of it. <clears throat> and they're going to sell it to you as, oh, that browser that keeps crashing because all of our web platforms are bloated fucking just incompetent shit that intentionally soaks up resources because their developers won't spend the time to architect and implement things properly, you know, to streamline things. Um, oh, yeah, that's the reason you should jump onto this cloud browser thing. So, yeah, <laughs> this this technology is going in an Awesome direction, guys. Awesome direction. So you're my. saying I can get 100% man in the middle for my convenience? Yep. Mighty Joe Dumb. Sign me up. The, yeah. the, name, the name Mighty Browser gives me the impression that someone wanted to call it Brave Browser, but then they realized that was already taken, and so they called it Mighty Browser. <laughs> And to be fair, I don't see much difference between them in a few key aspects. We don't exactly have broadband infrastructure that would support this well either. I mean, maybe in a place like Japan, they would. Not that you would want to get man in the middle for everything, because you just gave up all of your personal everything, and you are 100% being studied, as you brought up. But stadia google stadia the idea was that you didn't need to buy a ps5 or you didn't need to buy an xbox we will buy that we will put it in a rack and we'll just stream over broadband to you full quality everything coming out of this thing and our latency is so low that this is just going to kill it in terms of experience don't worry about the fact that it's not actually plugged into your tv how long was Stadia out for? Like 18 months or something before they needed to fold it? And I'm not sure if it's because people didn't want it, if the model didn't work, you know, whatever you want to say. The only use case I could see as potentially legitimate for this was if you had platform dependent this or that, like say a Java requirement that needed to sit under a web app, you could potentially give somebody utility by abstracting it somewhere, but you still lose all security aspects of that. I don't know how on modern hardware you could actually make the argument that there's not enough hardware under you to render a web page, essentially. If you need to do tab management, uh, maybe just close your tabs occasionally. Like you, you might not <gasps> watch that YouTube video. Blasphemy. Nobody closes and tabs. And also a few big things that people spend most of their time on could alleviate the issue just not being incompetent engineers. 
Like th- there is no reason that three or four tabs of Twitter need to take up more than a gigabyte of my RAM and constantly seize up my CPU by trying to randomly re-render things. <laughs> yeah, occasionally I'll just note that my laptop is running fans and I'm not doing anything. And then I'll pull up, uh, you know, an activity monitor and I'll see, oh, look, there's a Twitter tab stuck at 100% on a processor somewhere because clearly somebody wrote something poorly. Good job. Good job. Mm -hmm. It's like, this is like, this this thing is like, mark my words, this will outright get bought by Google. Um, Next couple years happening. Mark my fucking words. Yeah, but or else like, they'll the, just buy all the data that comes off of it. But but it's like th- th- this is exactly where these companies want to push technology. Anything that you actually own device wise is just an interface for their back end where they can see and catalog and study every little fucking thing you do and just data mine you for everything you're worth. And it's it's just cloning the mobile phone model really back to the browser. I mean, dude, I would say this is trying to push shit full circle back to the sixties and the fucking seventies where that is literally how it worked. All you had was a terminal that talked to the one big thing that does all the computing. Yep. Just wait till you get deplatformed from that thing. Google. Yep. Fucking great times. So, are we ready for some arguably funner news? Depending on what your attitude is about a lot of things, you might think it's bad. Funner. News. It's funner. So, um, Core O dot twenty one dot one has been released, and we are officially in Taproot signaling for the speedy trial period. And I believe so far, um, Slush Pool mine the first signaling block and then as well i think f2 pool is now signaling as well as um foundry the dcg um silbert pool group um so yeah we are in the first part of the gauntlet and um we're about to find out if miners will just turn this on with no drama and bullshit and we can all move on or if we actually have to dig in and play the UASF game again, if for some stupid reason um, over the next three months we don't trigger this. Um, so yeah, let's uh, see what's going to happen. I don't virtue signal often, but when I do, it's for taproot. Let's just say that if, and I think this is honestly pretty unlikely, speedy trial fails, um, there is going to be a lot of egg on a lot of developers' faces for not just starting this whole thing off with we're we're not doing the minor thing again. Like we're we're not giving them a de facto veto. It's just gonna be really annoying. That 90% threshold is pretty high. And if if they get right next to it and don't happen to hit it, and then we have to do all sorts of other crap to turn this shit on. I just hope they learn from that. Yeah, I mean, hopefully this just works out. I mean, you know, I, I feel like when it, when it comes to the base client with Lot True and the UASF at the end, I feel like everybody is just kind of looking at how Luke is acting about it. And Luke is Luke. Um, he is very opinionated. He has very unique axioms that he builds up arguments from in his head. And if you didn't just show up yesterday, you know that. <laughs> but like people act like the based client exists to like intentionally disrupt shit and fuck things up. It's no, it's there in case this fails and we'll see what happens if it does. But yeah, that doesn't mean this is just here to fuck with Taproot or the, like, like, let's see what happens. If this works, speedy trial succeeds. Awesome. Um, if it doesn't, the conversation afterward gets a little simpler if people aren't just stubborn as hell about it. But 
here's to hopefully no drama and let's hope that beer that I cracked to celebrate yesterday uh, just leads to smooth sailing. Yay. All right, on to other types of signaling. Hmm. So this is um, this is good news if you heard about the Blockstream satellite feed and thought, oh, that was cool. And even with um, the kits they previously sold, were not able to get that working or didn't buy it because you felt like it was a little over your head technically. Um, they have released um, a new product, the base station, which is quite literally everything in one device. Um, the, the entire SDR kit to transmit from the satellite signal to something your computer can talk to, um, hooking this all up to a node, the actual receiver to be, it's all just one thing in the dish with literally an ethernet port. So you just plug that in, it's on your network, you can hook your node up to it. There, there is literally nothing else to do but point it at the satellite and plug in that ethernet cable. So if you have been avoiding trying to take advantage of that or set up a, a satellite node because you didn't feel like you could uh, technically hack it, this has just brought that, that bar of technical knowledge about as low as it can get. Yep, power over Ethernet, no maintenance. You don't need a separate computer to do any decoding. You plug it in, it essentially just turned the satellite feed into a cable modem equivalent. It's pretty great. Mm -hmm. What we really need, and what I hope we eventually get, is other entities running these feeds. So, I mean, there's no reason you can't reuse the whole software like encoding stack. You know what I mean? Drop Starlink already, Musk. Here, here. So, Janine, I heard the IRS is asking for Bitcoiners' help in breaking Bitcoin again. Uh, yes, they are. Um, so, if anyone may have noticed, I actually uh, have not been able to find where exactly this was posted because the website that it comes from is feedback.gsa.gov, which I think is kind of a website for just general posting of contracts, but all of the articles that I saw referencing this document, which is not even like a hosted, like you can't click on it and view the PDF, it immediately down, it's a download link, which is a bit annoying. Um, so I'm not sure where they posted it, but it looks similar to all the other contract proposal documents that I've seen from the RS before, which I've covered in my privacy newsletter. Um, basically sometime in March, the IRS, uh, drafted a document basically saying that they were seeking someone to, quote, combine the leading edge cybersecurity research available on the topics of embedded hardware exploitation with the disciplined established science of digital forensics to, uh, unquote, to engage in decrypting hardware wallet devices. Um, and so as far as the document goes, I won't read the whole thing. It's about 25 pages long. But basically, they say the objective of the proposal, which, by the way, is limited to U.S. citizens and or U.S. residents, um, the objective of the proposal is to validate cybersecurity research in cryptographic wallet exploitation, identify new methods to gain access to cryptographic wallets, identify successful cryptographic method models exploits uh, can be, wait, identify successful cryptographic models exploits. They Okay, the IRS does not know how to write. Um, someone should get a spell check in here can be accomplished document the processes hardware and skill sets needed for reproduction in an advanced digital forensic laboratory and create hands-on training for the identified techniques in support of irs criminal investigation digital forensics laboratory um i do not recall seeing uh a dollar amount but they usually include a dollar amount in these types of things um basically it just kind of goes through the tasks um, and they want, they also are very specific that they don't want a one-time solution. They want something that will apply to 
all hardware wallet devices. Um, which, uh, good luck with that. Um, because what they are going to run up against, um, I mean, yes, there are, as Trezor did when they responded um, to this contract, I don't think I can check right now if it specifically mentioned Trezor anywhere. I don't recall it doing that. No, it does not. So they don't specifically mention any hardware wallet device, but I did see that Trezor published a um, thread acknowledging this contract proposal, which I'll read in a bit, but um, yeah, they didn't mention any specific hardware devices, um, and but they do mention like the types of uh, attacks they're looking for. They're looking for publicly available exploits, RF, USB, software and firmware review, circuit board exploit, microcontroller exploit in sight, microcontroller exploit removed, um, just kind of possibilities, but um, obviously, as everyone knows, if they don't figure out a way to do this, they're going to run up against, you know, uh, you know, they're going to have to deal with the part where cryptography is involved, um, because, uh, yeah, they are going to have issues with that, of not being able to maybe get past that enough with the hardware, at least in a resource efficient way. Um, so yeah, and I don't think this contract proposal has been fulfilled, um, but I am still trying to figure out where it was posted because that might help. It was, I was not able to find it on like Sam's or the other website that usually lists government contracts, but, uh, yeah, there it is. It's in the article and I'm also going to have it in my newsletter. And then what was really interesting, like I said, the, the contract did not mention any specific hardware devices, but Trezor uh, posted a long thread where they said, uh, efforts to oppress citizens and erode individuals' rights to privacy, as we see here, are a great validator of Trezor's open source philosophy. Since the beginning, we have designed Trezor both in hardware and software to be as open as possible. Um, and by the way, also should be specific that uh, in the proposal, they cite the fact that the reason they need someone to do this, the IRS needs someone, is because when they, for example, have hardware wallet devices come up in their criminal investigations, which is the unit that this is from, uh, and they want to seize the funds, obviously they can't if they're on a hardware wallet device that was used properly uh, without the seed. That is the whole point. Now, obviously, it's a lot easier to exploit the device if you have physical access, so if they already have it in an evidence that um, can diminish its uh, ability to protect those keys, but still not easy, clearly, because they are now looking for people to help them break them. So anyway, Trezor's thread continues, suppose a three-letter agency asked us to add a secret hardware or software backdoor to Trezor. The reply is that it's not possible because everybody would immediately see that we've added something which doesn't belong there. There are thousands of security experts watching our every move, auditing every change in the code. This acts as a perfect fail-safe mechanism and no one would use the compromised version. When it comes to extracting secrets from the device, there is no such thing as 100% secure hardware. Uh, all hardware can be hacked. It's just a matter of resources and motivation. That's why we came up with the so-called BIP39 passphrase, which is a final layer of encryption that is not stored on the device at all. Only a user with a device and knowledge of the right passphrase can access the funds. Even if a three-letter agency gets their hands on your device and extracts, extracts the password encrypted secret from it, they still cannot seize your coins unless you give them the corresponding passphrase. Uh, and then more about BIP39. And interestingly, the last thing in their thread is actually a warrant canary. And if you go to it, uh, the date of issue for the warrant canary is April 29th, 2021, which is the same day that they posted this thread. So Trezor basically was like, yeah, uh, in response to this IRS contract, we're going to put up a warrant canary to warn you in case we get any requests that we cannot tell you about, which if you don't know is the purpose of the warrant canary. It's supposed to warn you if it disappears that something is wrong if you get a type of request you're not allowed to talk about. So yeah, I wish, I'm actually surprised. Uh, I wonder if they just updated their canary or if they, I, I guess they never had one, um, but I would recommend other wallets to also create canaries because that would be helpful in general. I like, 
I'm sorry. I just can't help but laugh at like half of that post and think about how many Trezor users out there um, have outdated firmware and could have their seed ripped out with like a $70 device. Um, yeah. Well, clearly the and, IRS does not have awareness of this device and it hasn't been very helpful, so. But I mean, I mean, like Trezor, so many things that they did in there just are screaming marketing to me. Um, like a passphrase is not magic and it also comes with the risk of forgetting it if you actually make a secure one. If you don't make a secure one, it is very potential for that to just get brute forced after a seed is broken. Like th this ultimately th is a physical security issue. And I can hear Rodolfo laughing in my head right now because a $70 device you can hack together if someone isn't updating their firmware versus lab equipment that requires specialized knowledge to operate with a cost of like 200 grand to peel a chip down where you can fuck it up. Think about what's going to take more time on an individual case. One of them, you're literally going to be able to just make a, a little USB device. Someone can just plug in and have a bunch of idiot officers pushing buttons and pulling keys out. The other one needs expensive equipment and a professional to operate it. And is not going to be able to get done as quickly, as cheaply, as as big of a scale. Like, th this is not something that's just magically solved by using a passphrase. Like, if, if this really is an issue for somebody, if, if they think the IRS is going to audit them, demand money that they don't legitimately owe, things like this they really need to sit down and think about how are they going to defend themselves from such a situation because just what your average person is going to come up with in terms of a passphrase that's not a significant barrier in a situation like this well it's significant enough that the irs is apparently trying to get a contractor to help them build something to do it i mean we don't again we don't know which hardware wallet device specifically they're addressing but they do say all hardware wallet devices and they don't want it to be a one-off solution either so which means they'll eventually start figuring this stuff out yeah this is the equivalent of wanting uh mobile phone cracking tools mm -hmm. yeah they should attack yeti cold first <laughs> but you know th that's kind of my point though fud like and where is the state of that technology at they literally just have black boxes cops can just plug your iPhone in and just break them. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting to me that the IRS is putting this out as opposed to the FBI, because I, I would almost expect the competence to sit over there. Uh, but I get why IRS specifically would want it. Oh, yeah. So that reminds me, since we're speaking about um, exploit devices and also with the recent, uh, with the last uh, show where I talked about the Celebrite device, did you guys know that uh, our good friends, our good blockchain surveillance friends at CypherTrace are partners of Celebrate? Fun times. They have a whole suite together. Sweet. But like, yeah, I mean, you know, defending Bitcoin against a situation where somebody like a government is showing up and going give me like that there is no magic solution to that like a passphrase doesn't magically fix it even the securest hardware you can get doesn't magically fix it it just makes it harder to do at scale it gives you more time to respond to that but like ultimately I don't like, especially a major wallet manufacturer, just acting like a passphrase being open like this is just a magical solution to any of this. It's not like you have to be proactive and really structure a solution to a situation like that. Like there is no just catch all magic like that. Still best practice freaks. I mean, dude, mm -hmm. I don't. 
I don't like people just giving general best practice advice when you're talking about situations like that. You can't do that. Like th there is no general advice for an individual's specific circumstances in a situation like that and the type of help they have available, the type of options they have available, the amount of risk to themselves. There would like, you can't just give general purpose advice about shit like that. Well, I'll give some right now. First of all, don't fight with the IRS people. Second of all, use a passphrase. That's very good general purpose advice, both those things. I would debate the passphrase. I feel like most people would come up with something that isn't really measurably secure. And if they try to do something secure, they're just asking to forget it and lose their coins. Any passphrase you have that doesn't already live on your device is an additional security layer. Yeah, but it comes with trade-offs. Of course it does. Alrighty, though. Are we ready to learn about some cool new trade-offs? Since when are trade-offs cool? Since they create more options. So, CoinKite dropped a new firmware update for the cold card um, 4.1.0 and this comes with a very interesting new feature um, so in terms of key backups really um, all you have is mnemonic seeds and shamir secret sharing and as far as i'm aware i think trezor is still the only um widely used device out there that supports that they have their own standard they made um that created a lot of compatibility issues with other wallets and then you have word seeds which work with everything so the new feature they introduced um pretty much it zors um seeds and so like uh, on a data level zoring is pre pretty much just imagine taking two binary numbers and doing binary math with them like two ones equals a one and one and a zero equals a one two zeros equals a zero you just do something you can reverse to change the values um and the feature pretty much allows you to take one um, mnemonic word seed and make um, multiple seeds out of that that are both completely valid seeds that you can use in a wallet you can load with money but when you reverse that Zor, you get the original seed that you started with back. And so with this, you can kind of go to the next level with like security and um, duress wallets, um, kind of, you know, take some money and get out of here down to the level of your seed. And instead of just having your main seed in clear, um, you know, stored or backed up wherever, you could Zor that and then have the seeds created from that and even put a little money on it to make it look like a normal wallet and only store those seeds knowing that you can always get your main seed back. But like the, the key important thing about this, this is not like Shamir secret sharing. Like this is not something where you can get your original seed back with only some of the pieces. If you lose a single um, child seed, I guess, from this, you completely lose access to the original seed that you started with. But like this, it's still just more optionality in terms of setting up layers defending your main stack. It's kind of like great for your seeds, but it's not redundant. And uh, referencing what we were just talking about, you're going to have a lot better luck with a passphrase for the average individual user here. Yeah, I mean, dude, if you do this, and here's a really cool thing about this. You can do this by hand. Like, th this is implemented as an automated feature in the cold card. You do not need the cold card to do this. So you can literally do this operation forwards and backwards by hand. Like, you know, this opens the door of like not even having something like a cold card when some dude shows up and kicks your door in to even make them think, oh, I could be playing games with my seeds like that. And you could still just have your little, 
you know, set of seeds with a little bit of money on them, let them take that. And as long as you still have copies of them, get your main stash and move it somewhere. Yeah. Or you could have a base device that has a passphrase on it that has a little bit of money on it. And then they get that, but they don't assume you have passphrase. That is just horrible general purpose advice, dude. Like I have met people who were literally proud to tell me that they set the same four digit number as their password for everything because they are sick of resetting passwords with email. Like just telling normal people without prefacing the risks there, just make a pat like that is a horrible idea. Oh, are you recommending that they split something up and losing any given piece will lose all their funds? Because it sounds like you need to talk to them about making quality passwords or passphrases as opposed to shitting on the idea of using a security feature in Bitcoin. It's not shitting on the security feature to point out when you go around and tell everyone to use a passphrase that for half the people listening, potentially that equals one, two, three, four and provides zero practical security. It sounds like you need to educate people better. Yeah, and that starts with just not telling somebody to blindly do something. Anyway, though, I think Iran um, is rethinking their whole um, central bank only thing stance. Oh, yeah, this is a nice one sentence. -er. So evidently, Iran has declared that licensed banks and money changers in the country can use cryptocurrency that has been mined by officially sanctioned miners. Aka registered, paid whatever the fuck energy rates you have to pay, whatever, for imports. Uh, a very nice one sentence um, release. So basically, it is absolutely fine to use your cryptocurrency in Iran to buy things to import. Um, this is kind of a fundamental potential use case of Bitcoin being acknowledged for international trade, which is cool. Well, I mean, I, th I think there's a little bit under the hood here extending this to commercial banks. Like... You know, what, what's, what was the motive behind that? Like, are miners just not willing to sell directly to the central bank? Was the, like, did the central bank decide this is too hard or too difficult to try to do everything themselves like that? Like, I haven't read anything official that said the central bank holds Bitcoin or anything like that. So I, I have no idea. Well, I, I mean, the the last time they mentioned um, setting up this framework, I'm pretty sure it was literally only the central bank who could play a role in this. And now they're kind of saying like, you know, commercial banks and stuff like that can actually participate too. Yeah, I'm trying to remember if the clause in there was like they had the right to buy some of that cryptocurrency or, or how that framework was supposedly set up. Um, this definitely makes them more resilient in terms of uh, denying just the central bank from somehow using Bitcoin on the international stage. Now you have to deny individual commercial banks. And, all right. Mm -hmm. And I guess close to that part of the world, um, although I haven't really seen this definitively confirmed anywhere. Uh, yeah, a after a couple exchange collapses in Turkey, like the one we uh, talked about last week. Apparently, the Turkish government wants to set up a giant central Bitcoin depository, and you're not allowed to do anything with Bitcoin unless you use the one single official Bitcoin depository. So uh, if, if that happens, it seems like a... Sparse. That's that seems like a massive, idiotic, unnecessary central point of failure. And if they actually do that, I really think we're teeing up for one of those the time traveling Citadel Bitcoiners post um, doesn't pan out per se, but it rhymes like that would be really fucked up if they did this. 
and everybody's Bitcoin in Turkey winds up in a single custodian and then they get compromised or they get hacked. And yeah, that, that, that would just completely wreck everybody exposed to Bitcoin in Turkey. Sounds like paper Bitcoin, aka PayPal Bitcoin, is going to be the way to go in Turkey. I really hope if this happens, at the very least, they really research and think through cold storage options. Because, yeah, I, I cannot think of any dumber thing than let's put all the Bitcoin for a whole country in one wallet. All right, I guess... Uh, I guess this worked out. Kind of had the uh, the one sentence series all packed together. Got one more. So Liquid in the latest um, Elements release has actually dropped out some of the, um, I guess you could say the rails for dynamic federation support. So it's not rolled out or activating or anything they're still going to have to go through the slow headache of getting the hardware security modules update or updated but the actual software node client is all set up now for support when they can finally get around to doing that so hopefully by the end of the year the federation um, can become a dynamic thing where people can be voted in and out and also if we get Taproot soon with no drama, then there's a lot of interesting potential in that the main chain multisig is no longer capped at 15 participants. So that could actually get really fun in terms of seeing how robust you could make a federation model. Where are we, are we past the phase where everyone thinks liquid is cool anymore? Is it not cool anymore? Cricket, cricket. Oh, well. Maybe it'll be cool again. You know, the, the 80s got kind of cool after the 80s again, like the late 90s, early 2000s. All right. So Shinobi is going full autism right now. In the last Sea Lightning release, um, they included experimental support for the new dual funded um, channel model. And so I think a couple days ago, um, maybe even yesterday uh rusty russell pushed a uh, pull request to the lightning specification repo to include not only the version 2 channel opening spec um which pretty much retains the same interaction flow as the uh previous version where only one side could with an extra transaction collaboration phase which is essentially just where both sides can go back and forth until um, they've agreed on the input and output mappings and then um, after a completion message um, exit that and then go back to the signing everything and um, normal channel opening flows but he also included in this um, his thoughts on channel splicing so that you can actually add or remove funds from a channel without successfully closing that. And really, it's just some simple logic building on the um, channel opening um, dual funded um, spec and protocol, where you essentially just do that with a little extra logic watching um, that splice transaction for confirmation. So it would pretty much just be aside proposing that um, you would go back to the transaction um, input output negotiation protocol and settle that um, when that's complete, handle all of that and push the chain. And then from that point, you can just keep updating and using the remaining balance in the channel and everyone will just track um, what's going on on chain after it's buried under six blocks both nodes can officially throw out um, the old commitment transactions and not care about that anymore um, this would also come with the nice benefit of um, until we get l2 the channel state management problem of having to keep all the the penalty and revocation information 
anytime a splice happens, once that's confirmed, you can ditch all that because that output where you have to worry about that doesn't exist anymore. And then there's also um, kind of thinking about multiple splices. So they are um, there are some kind of limitations in the proposed spec where until um, an in-progress splice actually confirmed deeply enough, um, no new splices can be instigated without paying a certain um, fee rate over the existing splice um, just to kind of make sure that that um, is going to override any pre-existing ones. And there's also um, just a little handling logic to take into account the possibility of like new HTLCs being created. So like, let's say one side of the channel um, proposed a new HTLC right before the other side um, proposed a splicing operation. Um, the spec kind of requires finishing setting up that new HTLC before the two nodes start negotiating any kind of splicing. So, um, yeah, hopefully, um, you know, no lightning devs see any kind of issues with this proposal or anything, because this would be really nice to have a final spec to this so everybody could start working on implementing it. Woohoo. All right. In, mm -hmm. in other news, banks, the gold banks come into the scene. First one is U.S. Bank uh, says they are going to do a couple things. Supposedly, they've been chosen to administer NIDIG's ETF, should it chip someday, uh, which is kind of interesting. I, I'm not exactly sure why NIDIG needs U.S. Bank to administer it, and you don't hear about them. Uh, running uh, you know, ETFs, at least I haven't previously, but evidently that must be inside of their core competency somewhere. Uh, they also announced simultaneously that they plan to offer cryptocurrency custody products in partnership with an unnamed sub-custodian. Ooh, very mysterious over there at, at US Bank. Well, it could be Coinbase, or who knows, maybe it's NIDIG, uh, if they're announcing that they're going to run their ETF. Kind of sounds symbiotic. Um, somebody questioned them about whether it'd be Bitcoin or other stuff. Also, potentially, uh, it sounds like Bitcoin and other stuff is on the table, but no details yet. So this is one of those pre-release announcements uh, that's like half filled out. Uh, so we'll see when they come back to the market and start talking about what the details are here on this one. I'm I'm, I'm sticking with Coinbase. Um, that's my final answer. Boo. Let's see. In other, um, let's see, government approved investment fund type news. Uh, a class of funds in Germany called Spezial funds uh, has now been approved by the German government to custody up to 20% Bitcoin in their funds. Uh, evidently, this is a pretty large class of funds. I did not properly clip what it takes to be qualified to invest in these, but I think you, uh, you need the equivalent of being a qualified investor in the US. But evidently, there are about 4,000 of, of these funds. Uh, they hold about $1.8 trillion in collective uh, value under management. And right now, 0% of them are supposedly invested in cryptocurrencies. So uh, the floodgates will open. Next cycle, because we all know we're getting an 80% drop every cycle until Tina cries. Oh, and cry he shall. Uh, supposedly, this kicks in on July 1, though. Uh, so we'll see how quick they can act, I suppose. Maybe they'll be around to buy the top on this one. That would be a nice way to make holders of that class. Maybe. Or just get them real disappointed and run away, run away. Probably both. So what's one this more. last bankster update? Yeah, one more banking story. JPM! of all firms has now said they 
will scalp. I mean, offer actively managed Bitcoin related products to their high net worth individuals uh, that they bank. Um, this one's also light on details as per the standard banking release. Uh, but actively managed is uh, is one of the key takeaways. So they get to charge some some fee structure for adding some punch to this, and the fund will be offered to the bank's private wealth clients. Um, the story I'm reading here does not mention exactly what it takes to be in that category. Uh, when Morgan Stanley, Rich. yeah, exactly, and others came out with this usually that means several million dollars of uh, net worth but this is a notable walk back from diamond who has a history of talking shit about bitcoin and talking about how he would fire uh, jp morgan employees that even brought it up so uh yep Another big bank says they're going to come play. So we'll, we'll see how this comes out when they announce the details. We all know that on the way down, he's going to start screaming about how I told you it could hit over 100K and then crash. It's going to fucking zero. Yeah. I, you know what's great about all these things is when these banks come and announce, they always say we're going to do something next quarter uh, or you know later this year. And this is just going to line up such that the people who ultimately get exposure to Bitcoin are buying more of a top than they would be right now. So I, I can only see this helping us do our cycle peak and potential correction. Yep. And then they get the benefit of scaring clients away from Bitcoin. See, we told you you'd get wrecked. Yep. Right away. Speaking of running away, though, a lot of money really just bolted away from BitMEX after uh, <laughs> they implemented their KYC program. And I smell a little bit of desperation. Um, they're starting a new partner program with 12 other um, platforms in the industry. And I literally have never heard of any of these except Paxos. Um, so I'm assuming most of these are small shit rinky dink exchanges and pretty much trying to offer like a, a profit share with their partners in this in exchange for trying to drive customers and liquidity BitMEX's way. So yeah, I, I think this is their gasping attempt to correct um, the consequences of the reality that the whole reason they were such a fucking massive marketplace in the first place was the lack of KYC. I like. I don't think we're ever going to see BitMEX get back to the point that it was prior to that. And I, I think they're probably starting to realize that. Yeah, so it is. And I've heard of all of about one of these companies, maybe two that are supposedly in this partner program, which makes me assume this is for non-US peoples. Yep. The, the banished bit Mexicans will never be welcome back again. They closed the border to us. See ya. I guess this one is just a quick little uh, ha ha. But uh, last week we mentioned that Coinbase was going to start trading usdt and um nope sorry um not happening until next month because they ran into some issues with their api so i i kind of would like to know a lot more about the issues with the api seeing as they were supporting tether on ethereum and half of everything they have listed there is just the random shit tokens on Ethereum. So like what went wrong in their API structure and everything where they couldn't support just another shit token on Ethereum? Like I'm kind of curious about that one. I kind of assume it's the API interface somewhere with the US government, be it New York State, be it federal. I kind of think that's the linkage. <laughs> 
I, I just I don't see it. It's it's flip flip a switch. It's a, it's a new token on the thing you already have integrated. Yeah, to blame it on your API sounds like a joke. Well, very fitting for Coinbase. Well, I guess Janine, uh, that takes us to uh, you for the last one. Yeah, I mean, this is mostly a shout out. Uh, Alex Gladstein published a long form article in Bitcoin Magazine about the history of the petrodollar a few days ago, um, and it basically covers the history of the petrodollar since the early 20th century following through World War II, the Bretton Woods standard, the Vietnam War, which, as he points out, was the first American war waged almost entirely on credit. Uh, the ongoing myth of Fort Knox, there's no gold there, or certainly not enough. Um, and as he explains in the essay, for anyone who doesn't know, the petrodollar is a U.S. dollar paid to a petroleum exporter in exchange for oil. And kind of the thrust of the essay is about the U.S. government's relationship with Saudi Arabia and how that ongoing economic relationship since the 1970s basically has had some interesting geopolitical consequences and even uh, in terms of the U.S.'s desire to control the global economy and have, you know, this control through the prevalence of the dollar as something that a lot of countries hold in reserve. Um, a lot of more recent wars, for example, Iraq, uh, were kind of influenced by the U.S.'s desire to prevent other countries from going off of this petrodollar standard. Um, so that, I mean, I find it just really interesting in general because it ties together like several decades of chains of events. And I think this is again, another topic that, um, that is kind of overlooked in terms of the motivations for why certain wars started and what was the actual trigger for them which surprise was usually not anything to do with the thing that they said it was um there was and and even if there were other triggers there was always economic considerations in the background that kind of trumped everything else so um yeah i just thought it was a good essay and has a lot of interesting history in it yeah, I you guys remember this... when we bombed Iraq because Saddam wanted to start trading oil in the Euro? Mm hmm Yeah, there's there's a long history of uh, so-called noble lies to extend the uh, financial sovereignty of the United States uh, predicated on, you know, whatever you choose. Uh, I thought this piece was exceptionally well put together. I listened to Guy Swan narrate this one. Uh, great writing, Mr. Gladstein. Appreciate it a lot. Yeah, and I also want to read the beginning because, um, I mean, the essay is about the history of the petrodollar, but the reason he wrote it, um, as he states in the beginning, is because in its growth from conceptual white paper to trillion dollar asset, Bitcoin has attracted enormous amount of criticism. Detractors focus on its perceived negative externalities, energy consumption, carbon footprint, lack of centralized control, and inability to be regulated. Regardless of the validity of these arguments, few critics stop to think comparatively about the negative externalities of the world's current financial system of dollar hegemony. This is in part because many Bitcoin critics see it as just a visa-like payment platform and analyze its performance and cost by transactions per second. Which, by the way, to this day, I am still seeing that freaking stupid statistic about how Bitcoin can only do seven transactions per second. Like, seriously, there are a bunch of journalists who are stuck in, like, I don't know, 2016 or something. Like, please update your numbers it's embarrassing um but anyway so continuing uh bitcoin is not a fintech company competing with visa is it it is a decentralized asset competing to be the new global reserve currency aiming to inherit the role gold once had and the role the dollar holds today so i also like that because again this is something that a lot of the people who literally their opinions about how bitcoin is good or bad for the environment all depends on that stupid nature article that we literally debunked three years ago and other people debunked three years ago and have debunked many times since 
And they still continue to cite that, um, having not uh, read it. And by the way, surprise, yes, Digiconomist is funded by the Dutch Central Bank. Um, boo boo. Uh, no one cares, though, because they uh, they don't look at where the money comes from. And maybe they should be doing that more because clearly that is important. And that is what this essay is all about. I'm sorry. Yeah, Nick- I just I, I it would be remiss of me to not chuckle a little on Mike about um the person who just rage quit the recording room because of, of what you just pointed out, Janine. <laughs> and you're feeding the trolls. Uh Who's mad? Nick, Nick Carter just uh put out he started a YouTube channel to comment on this just the other day, which I thought was fun how people keep bringing this up. And I saw an article, I'm trying to remember, it might've been a Bloomberg article that was talking about how bank loan recipients have something like 400 or 700 times as much carbon footprint as bank branches themselves. And like, oh, okay, so it's it's the people spending the money that are really the problem here, I think is is what they're trying to get through by that article. Now, I found a nice infographic the other day that's talking about energy use amongst various forms of money and tons of CO2 produced. And it's uh, it's kind of hard to give full effect of it over audio, uh, but they credit Bitcoin mining with using 113 terawatt hours of energy. And I assume this is per annum. Gold mining uses 85. Gold jewelry production uses 140. Gold recycling uses 41. Paper currency and minting uses 15. And bank branches and ATMs use 700 terawatt hours per annum, which makes it really easy to figure out where most of that energy use is is focused. So there's a lot of different ways to cut the Bitcoin cake, but at the end of the day, what it's aiming to offer is a stateless reserve currency for the world and it's pretty cheap compared to what we have right now also uh given you know that yesterday was may day i would like to point out if uh people would like to engage in the act of burning things but also want to care about the environment um i would suggest burning things that actually has an impact on (laughs) on the systemic destruction of the environment and not for example cars like do you know how much hazardous chemicals are in cars and when you burn them that gets released into the atmosphere what does burning a car actually do besides make a pretty fire that you can all dance around for several hours it's very funny i don't like cop cars as much as the next person but still find better things to burn if you're going to burn them maybe even just don't give your money to businesses and governments that don't represent the things that you want. You don't burn the whole car, dummy. You just take the tires and burn those in a pile. Biochar is supposed to be a pretty good way to go. And you get lots of good benefits in ag once you burn that. Also, if you're going to get drunk around said fire, maybe don't leave your frickin' beer bottles everywhere and especially break them because i don't know trash is also not good for the environment apparently there's this like ongoing uh i don't know brain fart among people who do these kinds of protests where they really care about the environment and want to protest it and at the same time they just leave their trash everywhere like please (laughs) can you can you i don't know i i guess it's just it just really bugs me because I grew up in an environment where leaving trash, like just throwing your shit on the ground as if someone else was just going to pick it up was like not a thing that, I mean, sure, you get it on the highways because people throw their shit out of their cars apparently, but like, sorry, just not something I'm used to. And I'm surprised that the people who will most vigorously claim to care about the environment are also perfectly fine just throwing their trash everywhere yeah there's there's people in my neighborhood for whatever reason that are are out having fun i can only assume and will occasionally smash up a beer bottle on the sidewalk and they're 
trying to cut up my dog's paws, evidently. I don't understand exactly why you would want to do that, but that's the sum total of your action. And, you know, it, it's a lot of fun to smash a beer bottle, but it's no good for anybody but you. So please take your time, you know, set it down gently and uh, go about your day. If you want to smash beer bottles, do it in your own kitchen like an adult alcoholic. To carry the analogy over, uh, clean up your shit coins. Stop complaining about Bitcoin when you're using a giant financial censorship oil-backed mess and claiming that's better when actually it's so much worse. Yeah, the first thing you have to write about if you want to talk about carbon production is the the net um, fossil fuel expenditure of the U.S. military complex. That's uh, the number one consumer in the world, and that's kind of where you got to start. Alrighty, final thoughts slash meme time. Go. I am thinking. Fascinating. Yes, my thinking is fascinating. I would say uh, keep it simple. Use use what's on hand and uh, defy Shinobi thinking that you can't understand security protocols surrounding Bitcoin because uh, I think you can. I think you can figure it out. I have faith in you people. The smart ones will. Uh, my final thought is that, uh, again, another Assange update, as I tend to do for final thoughts, but there is quite an interesting article published by Declassified UK in the last week or so. Um, a lot of it is sourced from a book published by the former foreign minister, I believe, for the UK, um, Alan Duncan. And it's kind of amazing because this was not a FOIA, this was not a leak, this was literally a man publishing a book of his diary entries, which reveals that a bunch of people in the UK government very glibly basically worked their asses off to get Ecuador to cancel Julian Assange's asylum for like several months they were they were focused on this and there's an article that includes excerpts from his book of his own diary entries where he's celebrating this and talking about what he's doing and also other documents that they've obtained about the kind of weird little clubs uh, that were engaging in this behavior and it's pretty amazing that you literally have a state uh, doing carrot and stick dances with another state to get them to deny a journalist political asylum. Yep. It's nice when it occasionally leaks, like Kamala Harris, the vice president of the United States, I believe, referring to oil wars. Fun time. Well, I guess my note, um, I will tell people to stop being dumb on Twitter. If you are one of the people engaging in the current liquid versus Monero debate as if either of them are some kind of scam, you're a moron. <clears throat> and I say this as somebody who think is <clears throat> excuse me, who who thinks that Monero has what will probably be fatal scaling problems if they can't figure out a way to fix them in the long term. That doesn't make it a scam. Bitcoin had open-ended scaling issues early on. And also, Liquid being a federated model and a different you know, trust trade-off than you're okay with does not make that a scam. Everybody stop being a fucking moron and, ju and just being tribalistic idiots over dumber and dumber things. Okay? Like, use your brain. Come on. There's a Monero versus liquid debate. Yeah, and it's getting really stupid. April seems like a really good month to take a month off Twitter. Mm-hmm. But I guess on that note, that's a wraps. Catch you later, punks. Peace. A, a, la a final word from our mascot. Was there, was there, that's a good